Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Catherine Miller. I'm the Vice President of Impact at the James Beard Foundation. Um, welcome to my fifth and final seminar for the Sign Institutes of Politics and Policy at American University. Um, I want to say a couple of thank yous and then introduce my guests and then um, give you a little bit of context and then we'll talk for a bit and then we are happy to take questions via the chat function. Um, so this is really meant to be sort of an interactive discussion, but I want to first thank the American University President Sylvia Burwell, um, Dean Vicki Wilkins from the School of Public Policy, and then the Science Executive Director Amy Dacey for this fellowship and for this opportunity to really um, bring together some of my favorite people in food and politics and policy over the last couple of months together to talk about the impacts on the community. Also, we really want to say thank you to Charles Leggett and um, Lanasa, um, Lanasa Clarkson from the AU and sign teams who really have made it possible for us to move this online and for everybody to register and get everybody in um, and on this and get the guests all signed up. It's, this is a team effort and you know the, the university, like all of us, has had to pivot and the classes have had to go online. And so I really just appreciate all the hard work and resources and thought that's gone into that. And so thank you to everybody at AU for giving us this opportunity. Um, I'll introduce them more fulsomely in a second, but tonight I'm joined here tonight by Jamila Robinson, who is the food editor for the Philadelphia Inquirer. She's also the vice chair of our James Beard Foundation Journalism Committee. Um, I'm also joined by Davida Davison, Davison, who is the executive director of Food Lab Detroit, um, and Niaz, I, uh, Niaz Dory, <laughs> sorry, I always mispronounce Niaz's name, and so I always stumble over it because I'm always self-conscious. But anyway, they are the coordinating and executive director at the National Family Farm Coalition and Northwest Atlantic Marine Alliance. Um, these are really three of my favorite um, women and people who work in food are from around the country and represent very um, distinct and unique constituencies that but the constituencies that power our food system. So um, I'm just super excited and honored to have them here for this virtual session. Just a couple of uh, frame scene setters is that when I proposed, when I was invited to propose the seminar uh, series from AU, it was really centered on what we call at James Beard Foundation, the idea of good food for good. How are we building and reinforcing a food system that does the things that it should do? How does it employ people um, with meaningful wages? How does it engage people um, in community? How does it support local livelihoods? How does it do all the things that a food system should and can do? And really what the goal of the seminar series was to also introduce that idea of what our food system should do in a place where policy and politics are sort of paramount and rule here in Washington DC at AU. There was no better place to have that conversation. We've been, this is my fifth and final seminar series, as I said, but the first two were, you know, kind of optimistic that pre first three pre COVID pre any of this. And we were talking about how we were going to pass the child nutrition bill, how we were going to fight for more food waste, uh, money for more food waste diversion, how we were going to really promote the idea of sustainable seafood. It was super positive. It was also a little pessimistic about the, the idea that policies would do that and really focused on how people and consumers and um, chefs and restaurants and farmers were going to do it. Um, and then four weeks ago, the world changed for us in the restaurant industry. If you were on my last seminar series with chefs Kwame Anwache and Christine Sikowski and Amy Brandwine, you heard how this swept through the restaurant industry um, with such speed and viciousness. Um, we're now looking at around probably 11 million people unemployed directly within that industry. Um, restaurants at zero reservations, restaurants not buying from local farmers and fishermen, um, millions of people collecting unemployment, millions of people unsure when they're going to go back to work um, because of physical distancing and social distancing. There are a whole host of other people um, because of where restaurants sit that have been impacted by COVID in um, similar ways. And with Davida and Jamila and Niaz, we're going to talk about those because these are the small businesses the community-based businesses, the food producers and purveyors who are also hurting at this time and looking for how we as a community might come together um, and support them. A little bit more 
fulsome introduction of each of these amazing um, humans. So you know, Davida is uh, a preacher's daughter, um, and you'll hear that in how she speaks and how um, eloquently she always um, presents her case um, for her constituency and her members. She is the executive director at Food Lab in Detroit. This is an organization that fosters the creation of an inclusive and equitable local food economy. Um, it is really primarily focused on incubating food entrepreneurs from communities of color. Um, and it really is one of the organizations that I always look to to see what they're doing in terms of how they build community and how they democratize this idea of good food and allow everyone to take part in the development of local food culture. So um, she is with us. Um, Niaz Dori is here with us. She has been a community organizer for over 30 years. Um, she really is uh, it's such a powerhouse and a quiet one and really a, a, a funny little anecdote about Niaz. Niaz, I asked them for a headshot and she was like, I don't do headshots anymore. I only want to show pictures of me within my community and working in my community. And I think that's sort of paramount um, in my understanding of her work. Um, she has been serving I'm in a very non-traditional but innovative leadership model for about two years now as both um, the head of the National Family Farm Coalition and the Northwest Atlantic Marine Alliance. Uh, and these are two organizations that are really looking at how we cement the relationship between land and sea and our small producers and farmers. And so just thrilled to have them with us um, tonight. And then sort of last but not least is um, Jamila Robinson, who had the auspicious thing of taking a new job early in February. <laughs> um, she um, became the uh, food editor of the Philadelphia Inquirer um, early in February. She was formerly the Atlantic uh, editorial director at Atlantic 57. She managed content development for US Today, USA Today's network of food and wine experiences, a big 12 city tour of food festivals. She was a senior editor at the Atlanta Journal Constitution. Um, and as I mentioned, she's also on our journalist, she's the vice chair of our journalism awards committee. So I just hope that the, um, we can have a rich conversation with the three of them. And I, you know, I'm gonna start with a really basic question and maybe, um, and Niaz, I'll start with you. How you doing? <laughs> <laughs> Well, how am I doing? That seems to be the <clears throat> rich question of the day, every day. Um, personally, as we had an ch opportunity to chat as a, as a group before joining the webinar, as I was mentioning to all of you, I have never felt simultaneously so privileged and so useless at the same time. I think uh, being able to um, work and have meaningful work and being able to continue to live in a place where, I honestly don't know those of you who are experiencing uh, very urban environments, living in rises, and having to experience that level of anxiety around just getting out of your house, are feeling, because I feel privileged to live where I live and be able to walk in these rooms. And, um, and so as a result, I feel like I'm okay. At the same time, every day is a new set of conversations with fishermen and farmers and people in general who are struggling. Our staffs at both organizations um, struggling to wrap their head around the struggles that they are experiencing. And so I'm fine. I feel like I have the... Um, uh, I feel you know we keep talking about we were made for these times, except there is a real unknown factor in these times that we don't know how to adapt to on a day to day basis, and that's what the challenge is before us. How do we rise up every day and not be stricken by fear, but look at the possibilities and hope that's before us? Yeah, and Davida, you were nodding when she when she was speaking. How are you doing? Yeah, I, I agree with, with uh, Nias. I feel incredibly um, blessed. I mean, never before have I um, had so much appreciation for the simple things like breath, being able to wake up and put my feet 
on the floor and inhale and exhale deeply, understanding that the coronavirus is so vicious because it goes after your lungs. And to be able to have full capacity and full use of my lungs where I can breathe in and out is a blessing. And so I just, I'm thankful. You know, um, I am a Detroiter, born and raised, um, but I lived in New York City for almost 20 years, so about 18 years. So over the span of about 18 and a half years when I lived in New York, I lived through 9-11. I was in the city. I lived through the financial crash on Wall Street. I lived through the blackout. I lived through barely, just barely. I lived through Hurricane Sandy. And it is because of Hurricane Sandy in which I lost my home and everything that I owned and I was homeless that that brought me back to Detroit. And so New York is second home for me. My father is the oldest of nine. I have five aunts who live in New York, um, who live in Queens, which is a very vulnerable borough um, right now. Um, and so there has never been, um, in the last two decades, um, a catastrophe and, uh, that has hit New York City that I was not directly involved in. So to be in a household right now, uh, surrounded and loved by my parents, to be in a community that's out in the suburbs of Detroit, to be able to walk around our subdivision. That's a blessing. And so I'm just thankful for the little things. Um, but I also hold attention in my heart because the community that I love and hold so near and dear to me, um, they're fighting for their life right now. Yeah. So um, I, m how I feel varies second by second, minute by minute. But right now at this moment, I'm thankful. Yeah. Jamila, you? Yeah, I, I'm going to underscore some of the things that Niaz and Davida said. Um, I'm very thankful. I'm so fortunate um, because I can work from home. Um, so many of my colleagues are working around the clock. Um, many of my colleagues, my friends at newspapers across the country, news organizations all over are being laid off or furloughed. Um, so this is a, um, impacting us very personally. Um, at the same time, it is our duty to do service journalism right now and to tell this story. Um, local journalism is more important now than it's ever been, um, not only from the, for the, from the restaurant industry, but being sure that communities are getting all of the information that we need. Food stories are those, this is about survival now. How do you get groceries? Is it safe to go to the grocery store? How do you get food? How can, if you cross state lines, what you should have in your pantry? How do you prepare? That kind of service journalism is absolutely vital right now. Um, I'm, but I'm thankful that I am sheltered in my house. I'm not leaving my house. Um, I'm the kind of person I take public transit. I'm in New York and Philadelphia and DC. Um, I, you know, my, I was also born and raised in Detroit. Um, I don't know when I'm going to see my family again. And so it's very, um, I ache. Um, I, I ache for my family. Um, but I also ache for the, I understand the importance of doing service journalism. So that is taking pre precedence over the pain that I feel about and the fear yeah. that I feel very directly about, um, about not being able to leave my house, missing my friends, um, and just wanting the energy of being in a restaurant or waking up in the middle of the night thinking, oh, I want to go to, and then realizing that everything has been appended and thinking at some point it's a dream that's gonna <laughs> that I'm gonna wake up from it and then realizing that it's time to get back to work and be sure that people have all the information that they need that restaurateurs have an understanding of what's coming um, from a policy perspective to be sure that communities know where they can um, get uh, food boxes if they are um, if they are um, if they've lost their job and they need resources, we want to be sure that we're providing that information. Yeah. So it's day to day, <laughs> a minute by minute, but I'm very no, thankful. No, and I think, I mean, we were talking about this a little before we signed on that we're all pretty thankful and sitting in these places. I think one thing that brings is common amongst all three of you too, is you haven't stopped working since this started 
happening. I mean, I've, you know, watched each of the organizations, everything, you know, um, maybe David, with you, I mean, how are you, how are you seeing this with the Detroit food community, which is both urban farmers and restaurants and local producers? I mean, how are they holding up? What what kind of response, community based responses are you seeing there? Yeah, there's it, it runs the gamut, and you're right. Um, have not stopped working, but you know what? Neither has the chefs and the restaurant tours. I just I just want to add some context, like. You, th our industry has been decimated. I mean, we are fighting for our lives. And yeah. so when you start to talk about the 16,598 restaurants that are in the state of Michigan, and that equates to 4, 498,000 workers, right? We saw that came out today, 16 million people now total are on the unemployment roll. More than 6.5 million just added uh, to the unemployment roll um, just last week. And through all that devastation, nobody in our community has stopped working. Chefs are still concerned about how can I feed my staff? How can I feed my community? How can I feed frontline workers? They are so selfless. Like they are putting their bodies, I mean physically putting their bodies yeah. on the front line here in the city of Detroit. And I am just in all of the fact that here they don't know if their business is going to make it tomorrow but they put all of that aside they're feeding the homeless right there are they are they are feeding frontline workers here in the city of detroit and my community has been decimated right yeah. particularly the african-american community right where we only represent 14 percent of the state but yet and still we represent 35 percent of the deaths of coronavirus but yet and still do it all do it all restaurants and chefs are still out putting their bodies on the front line making sure that they do what they do best and that is for you me and everybody else in the community so you know i i don't know it's it's, whew. it's no it's, it's a lot it's and it's it's so amazing and wonderful and yeah it's like i feel like it's the same with farmers i mean the pivot to CSAs by people who have only ever supplied, you know, <laughs> folks, the folks, I feel like the, the farmer and fisherman community has responded, but I also feel like those communities and even in the restaurant community, we also don't often talk about the undocumented and immigrant populations that don't have the support, aren't able to do this. I mean, somebody said to me about the Lee initiative, they're like, oh, that's nice. They're feeding restaurant workers who like, they'll come out of their house twice a day. And I'm like, no, they're feeding restaurant workers who depend on family meal is the only meal they're going to eat. That's right. Right? That's right? That day. But you Nia's know, like, how are you seeing your community respond? Because I feel like there's so much innovation and so much amazingness, but I sort of also am living for the day when I can go back to a farm. <laughs> yeah. Well, I have the privilege of um, having a global perspective. We work with fishermen. You know, Anama is part of an organization called the World, or we're affiliated with an organization called the World Forum of Fisher People. So we're learning about how this is affecting fisher people from Indonesia all the way to Alaska and everything in between and different levels of innovation and, uh, and desperation. And I'll get into that in a second. The same with, you know, on the farming scale, we're, um, NFFC is a national organization, but we're also involved with La Via Campesina, which is an international organization. So again, getting that sense of what's happening globally and what we're feeling on the ground in, in each one of these communities. Um, there's definitely, people have had to pivot, but <clears throat> what I want, what I feel like I have to remind ourselves about where they're pivoting towards is a collective mm. vision we've all had for a long time, which is if we want to have a truly sustainable, resilient, economically viable, equitable food system, we got to go back to the idea of re-regionalizing, relocalizing. Yes. Yes. And so what we're pivoting towards is necessary in this time of crisis. But what we have to really think about is what, when we emerge out of this, which we will emerge out of this, that we don't look at this as a response to a crisis. We see it as how we're laying the foundation for the future, for this new future that many of us have 
had in our mind's eye. It's in our mission statement. Yep. It's in how we've been working all along and we're pivoting towards really realizing it. Mm -hmm. At the yep. same time, we're seeing, you know, I was talking with uh, Patchwork Family Farm, which is part of our, one of our member organizations in Missouri, Missouri Rural Crisis Center. One of the first things they did, they've been fighting against factory hog farms since they first began, is boxing up pig parts and taking them to um, unemployed restaurant workers that have been their partners, for example. We had a call from a fishing uh, processing facility, distribution facility, Red's Best, here regionally, here in New England, calls me up and says, I want to make sure that the people who used to buy our stuff and now are on the unemployment line can still eat, but I don't want them to be forced to pay for it. How can we support those who need mm -hmm. the food? And, uh, and so how can we be charitable but not continue to build a society based on charity? And so how do we do that? That's the kind of stuff they're pivoting towards. And some of the models that uh, within the fishing sector, when we first started the community supported fisheries model, those entrenched in the status quo, you could almost feel the pat on the head to us saying, oh, that's really cute. Kind of a patronizing approach to the models you're, approach, you're, you're dreaming about and you're putting into play, yet those are the ones that are now feeding people. Yeah. So what I'm hoping that will get out of this is people who have relied on the social system that is now exposing all of its chinks in its armor, <laughs> you know, this, this global system of commodities and uh, kill them all and let God sort it out later, kind of an approach to food production. And they're now realizing their neighbors are growing food and have been catching food and raising food. And they're the ones feeding them. I want them to remember once they're out that they still eat from their neighbor's farm and from their neighbor's boats and from their neighbor's ranches. So how do we build that foundation, that cultural foundation right now so we remember post-crisis. That's what I want to pivot towards. No, I'm, I'm, I'm right there with you. It's, it's, it's really a blessing. And Jamila, are you, what are you seeing? I mean, you have this perch of being, looking at Philly, but also all the other involvements that you see nationally, the stories. Like what, what are you seeing in terms of how the industry and communities are responding to this? Sure. So it's definitely a pivot, not only a pivot to service, but it's also a pivot to understanding, a greater understanding of where our food systems come from. Um, we see in Philadelphia that some farms that were only supplying uh, restaurants are now supplying the community. People can now order right from the farm for pickup and delivery. It's also, um, we're seeing that with, um, with fisheries as well, uh, more communities, um, community served uh, fisheries and distributors that only sold to restaurants or only sold to grocery stores are now building a more equitable system so people have access to lower cost food. Um, one, one thing that we're also looking at is some of the policy and we're writing stories about things like people who have SNAP benefits, who can't have their food delivered and we're doing stories to pressure test whether or not that is going to be the best system coming out of that, out of as we emerge from this, have we built in systems um, that are that are not inclusive? Um, you know, looking at our farmers markets and where they are placed in neighborhoods, do people have access to uh, to fresh food? Um, we are seeing with the community serve um, with the food boxes that uh, the Philadelphia city government is providing for people who are hungry now have more fresh produce available because the farms are now produce are are. are are servicing um, the city boxes. So you're seeing this pivot, definitely more collaboration, um, and then seeing this response from the community of not only to the hospital workers, they want to, um, they are raising money to buy food for hospital workers who may not have access to it. Um, that, and, and in the restaurants, the restaurateurs, they're looking for ways to provide food for homeless people, um, people who don't have access to fresh produce, um, as well as collaborating just to keep those restaurants open, e either shifting for takeout and delivery. We've also seen some folks who have just said, this is too hard. Um, we are not positioned for, uh, for takeout and delivery, but that means that they're out actually rethinking their menus, what's gonna provide the best service for that community. Uh, so, so it is a real shift in landscape. Um, and 
from a news organization standpoint, it is, it is definitely a shift in coverage and being sure that we are covering not only um, policy, the policy aspects of food and the, um, along with entertainment. We've always known that immigration um, and all kinds of other issues impact the food systems. And now we're really seeing how that impact is, we're able to show very directly, um, you know, grocery store workers, um, they are on the front lines, these people who help provide the food. And now we can look at things like labor costs, um, you know, you know, what is the, what is the right wage, um, that they don't, may not even have, make enough, uh, an, enough money to buy food for themselves, even though they're on the front line. So these are the kinds of stories that we're doing. We're not leaving out the cultural and the entertainment piece of, uh, of food. That's always going to be there. Um, we're seeing a lot of people writing personal essays about the beauty of connecting through food. And we, I think we're gonna continue to see a lot of stories like that. It's also a great opportunity for us to expand our voices um, and, and be sure that these are stories that are being told from all kinds of perspectives. We know that um, a lot of storytelling tends to have um, a, a, a very white male centered lens and we have an opportunity to bring in more voices. And as especially COVID-19 impacts communities of color, it is very, very important that we be sure that we tell those stories and we connect those to the food systems and other um, inequities in our, um, um, uh, it, um, in our culture. Yeah, I mean, I feel like, yes, I'm trying to find some silver linings in this crisis, right, always. And one of them, I feel like we were always looking for a way to make Americans care about where their food came from again, because food was so easy to find, whether it was at a grocery store from a lot of people at a restaurant or whatever. And this has totally, from a news perspective, from, you know, people who, people who always laughed at my idea of like, get a CSA, now have a CSA. Right, because yeah. they, they don't want to go to the grocery store, right? right. Or um, people who, you know, are revisiting cooking, people, you know, I mean, we've all seen the stories like the runs on yeast and baking and all of that. But, you know, one thing, Niaz, that you said, which we've talked about a lot recently at the Beard Foundation is, you know, and in, in the early days, everybody referred to this as the existential, existential crisis of the restaurant industry. And we started saying, no, this is like a real crisis, right? We're gonna, we're trying to save off bankruptcies. The existential crisis is what kind of food industry do we want to be when we're ready to reopen, right? And can we hold the lessons, Niaz, as you said, that we're learning in all of this, right? That local food systems matter, that we contribute to the economies, that we're good community players, that we're all of those things. And you know, I'd, I'd love to hear from all of you how you feel about that because I feel like that. You know, that for me is, this is the opportunity for us to, never have we been blessed with the complete pause of an industry in any of our lifetimes, right? And this can be an opportunity when those restaurants reopen that they can have better relationships with their local farmers. They can prioritize local and regional spending. They can, like, they could if they decide to do that. I'm just curious, I mean, Davida, you talk to a lot of restaurants and a lot of food businesses, I mean, can they even think be in that headspace now or is it all survival? Yeah, so um, real quickly, because I'm, I'm really excited to hear from um, the rest of my panelists, but I'm gonna tell you um, where um, a lot of our energy at Food Lab Detroit is going toward. Um, and you're right, there are restaurants that are in um, survival mode, sure. And the reason why, Catherine, they are in this survival mode is because there is a moral dilemma that kind of rests in the hearts and the souls and the minds of many restaurateurs. And that moral dilemma is, do I pivot my business model if I'm capable of moving from being a dining room uh, kind of business model restaurant, do I pivot because I'm allowed to, to only do delivery or curbside or takeaway? or do I close altogether? And do you know the number one factor on why some businesses has decided that I'm gonna go ahead and pivot, even though in many cases they aren't even breaking even, it's because they wanna provide a job to the restaurant worker. They're staying open because they've asked their staff 
Should we close or should we stay open? And the staff resoundingly in some cases are saying, you know what, let's stay open. Let's pivot our model to delivery, carry out curbside, let's feed our people, but more importantly, I depend on this restaurant so I can feed my family, pay my rent, et cetera. And then there are some restaurants are saying, you know what, we don't know about this virus. It's too new. I don't understand it. I, you know, I don't want to put myself, I definitely don't want to put my staff in jeopardy. It's not worth it. Who cares if I've stayed open during the virus and then through it all, one of my staff members or I get sick. Yeah, right? So there's this moral dilemma. But here's the opportunity for us to have real conversations, Catherine, around policy change that really results into what Food Lab has been advocating for. And many, many organizations have been advocating for. Restaurant Opportunity Center comes to mind. And is that is how do we fight for better wages for restaurant workers? Right. This is the and for all food workers. I mean, and this has been food, exactly for all food workers. The hazard exactly. pay for people right now who are working in grocery stores, who are Absolutely. producing the food, the people that are driving. I mean, this has been the biggest challenge that we face as an industry is this thing of how, like, how we undervalue. Exactly. And so the question becomes, Catherine, what is the strategy that we need to put in place? And I'm just going to end it here and then we can get back to it later. But I want to give my panelists the time to talk. But this is where strategy comes into play. Because now restaurateurs, this is the industry that I'm most um, approximate to. Restaurateurs are saying, Davida, I know y'all have been talking about this, like fair wages, equitable wages, like eradicating tip wages. But how do we really do it? Like they're now open to really thinking about how do we do it? And how do we do it in a way in which we can change policy? Yeah. And so for many of us, we're having a conversation is that we need to be aggressive about the FSLA, the Fair Labor, Lander, Labor Act. And many restaurateurs and myself are wondering, why is it that restaurant workers, who we now consider, you know, essential employees, why, why are they non-exempt? Why can't they be exempt workers, right? Why can't they be classified in the federal government in FSLA, the Fair Statement Lander Act, as, as a, exempt workers? That means that we can now offer them, not hourly, but they now can be offered a salary. And yeah. we can start treating them, our restaurant workers, like the profession that it deserves, with the same amount of respect as lawyers, same amount of respect as accounting or any other white collar kind of um, j work. So yeah, we're Nia's, I see Nia is about to get power. in here. Her little, her oh, little. No, I'm, I'm captivated. I'm <laughs> yeah, so I'm there. Yeah. Yeah. I, I completely agree. I think we've, uh, uh, you know, there's a number of discoveries we're having as a society that I hope, and for many people, there, uh, it's an aha moment. For many people, it's I've been telling you this forever moment. Uh, and that one of those is the economic inequities in our society in general, whether it's the driver or the restaurant worker or the janitor in the hospital or the school. You know, we have um, class, the, the class <laughs> visions are showing themselves and we're realizing the so-called classes that we undervalued are the ones that are saving our asses right now. And so how do we really step up as a society and honor hard work equally? It's one of the, I love the concept of, of, um, of time banks because it's, it's all equal. It doesn't matter if you're an accountant or, or, uh, or whatever, a, a, a taxi driver, your service is equal to the person who's using it. And so how do we have a social scale time bank concept where it's really about the amount of work you do, not the work you do, that you're, um, that you're honored for that, for that work regardless. That, that is something that we have to acknowledge as a society that has been a long inequity, uh, economic inequity that needs to be addressed. There is another piece that we haven't talked about yet and I want to preface it by saying I'm not a vegan and I'm not a vegetarian. And I eat, as one of the fishermen I've known for a while, anything that doesn't bite me back. <laughs> However, I, it's really important to acknowledge the role of poor animal husbandry in bringing about this virus and holding animals in captivity in high concentrations. Some people say it's a theory. Um, I don't know. I'm going to take the precautionary approach and the humane approach here and say there is something about our food system that um, we have allowed animals to be kept in confinement in ways that is inhumane. 
Mm. And we've done it. We've permitted it to happen because we've been told that's the cost of, that's what it takes to get cheap food. We are experiencing the externalization of cheap food every single day in every part of our society right now. Those animals were feeling it every single day of their lives that they lived very miserably. And so I think the next responsibility we need to take seriously as food activists, as restaurateurs, is really to look at animals held in captivity, whether on our land or in water. You know, high concentrations of fish in a pen to me is no different than high concentrations of pigs in, in, in a factory farm. And if they don't have enough room to turn around, if they don't have enough air, but to come to the surface of the water for it, if they are struggling, we're going to pay for that struggle. We're paying for that struggle. That's one of the things that we really have to acknowledge here and really think about policies that honor the lives of the animals that have sacrificed themselves along the way so we can eat. Uh, no, and Jamila, I want to ask you, I want to try and bring these two things together, right? Because we, we originally when we proposed the seminar months ago, this was around the true cost of food, right? Could actually consumers wrap their head around how much their food was really going to cost if we were to do these things like pay fair the ultimate and fair wages and know exactly where our food came from and pay the farmer what it's worth but also higher quality right this industrialized cheap food right that was our, our food system that was built to deliver inexpensive food really efficiently with little or no um dense nutritional density just calories right and that was what we were all sort of being patted on the head of and said, trying to get a move away from that was super precious. And part of the biggest constraints around that was going to be chefs and restaurants and other folks being able to deliver a plate of food that consumers saw value in. Mm -hmm. And I, I, Jamila, I, the, the way I want to ask the question is, I now see people ordering food, spending lots of money to order food, being like, okay, fine, you can bring me that, whatever that is. And it's... 25% more expensive, like, you know, there's a, you know, there's just, I feel like there's a moment and to, so I'd love you just your thought on like, sort of like the cultural aspect of how we bring those two things together, wages Absolutely. and quality to consumers. It is, it is a, it is a, we have a real opportunity to tell people how much food costs. And I think as journalists, we need to have explainers, just as you would have an explainer talking about your taxes and how, you know, how, how, how this bailout is going to work. We have to tell people exactly how much food costs to get it to your plate. They have to have some understanding. There's a, a myth that chefs are super duper rich. They don't understand the super tight margins that they're on or that this system is collapsing on itself, not only because of coronavirus, but because of high rent costs and these super tight margins and everyone is living paycheck to paycheck. It's not just people in their houses, it's also chefs and restaurants. And so having a greater understanding of how much food costs, how much we're paying people, the expertise and skill that it takes. And then, and, and we have to be candid about the, the cost of takeout and delivery. It costs 25% more. There are, um, there are all of these fees associated with it. So if you're going to pay for, if you're paying for your food, let's actually break down the cost, how it gets to the table, the delivery, the, um, um, uh, the, the farming, the delivery, the packaging. And so people, and I think people are starting to understand that one, because they're going to the grocery store more and they're cooking more. And then they're realizing that, oh my gosh, I have to wash all my own dishes. Well, yes, we pay, have to pay people to do that. And we need to pay them a fair wage. Yeah. Um, and so imagine what you're experiencing right now in your homes Think of that on a much bigger on, on a much bigger scale, and I think if we are candid in our reporting about what that costs, and then some of those, and 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 being able to bring that to people in a very transparent way, um, and I think especially for foods that are are are, are cultural, um, your Thai restaurant, your Vietnamese restaurants, the the things that we will say, oh, I'm not going to pay twelve dollars for fried chicken and macaroni and cheese. Well, that chef 
is paying a lot of rent <laughs> um, and, the, and, and that has a lot of expertise around it. These foods that are cultural that we have called budget and we have, and so it's an opportunity for us to change our language, change our reporting, bring more voices in and be more transparent. That's what we're supposed to be doing as journalists anyway. It's not all entertainment, it's not all beauty and fun. We can show the real impact of these systems and then and then give people better ways to use their, um, to make better choices, not only at the grocery store for delivery, when we come out of this, um, being more cognizant of what food costs, um, how we should pay people and how that impacts the entire community. If we pay people better, they will be, they, they will bring more to their community. And if restaurants are the center of community, then there's a way that we can support that and being more transparent about the cost. Yeah, no, absolutely. Blue. I want to just solicit if there are anybody listening who would like to ask some questions, um, feel free to pull them in here. We've got about maybe 15, 20 minutes if these um, lovely humans can go a little bit longer um, to get those. So if they're, um, you can submit them through the webinars Q&A feature if you, anybody in the audience has questions. I, you know, it's it's interesting because I think one of the things around the um, CARES Act, right, for small business, um, the original piece of like, oh, all the restaurants are in there and they're going to get the piece of small business and stimulus. And then, but one of the things, and I, you know, I'll probably get in trouble for my restaurant friends is they are having to provide so much financial data and so many models and such a good and articulate a really good, clear understanding of their pre-COVID budgets that we now, like they now have the tools that they've always needed to, to take a step back and see like, okay, what does it actually cost me to have full freight, no tips, just full freight if I have to pay for those folks, mm -hmm. right? What does it cost me if I want to keep buying from those folks? They, there, there's a pause too there that I hope the, the owners themselves will take a look at, which is that they now, if they've applied for these loans, they now have hard financial data about the core of their operations that go even as deeply as those true costs of labor, because they're no longer sort of thinking, oh, how much of that's gonna be offset by tips, right? Or how can I do that? Like, it's, it, there's an interesting opportunity, I think, for the business owners too. Um, are there, yeah, nice. Yes. It's an interesting piece that we're experiencing with farmers and fishermen. People don't think of them as business people. Mm -hmm. And so they struggle in this moment. Yeah, I was talking with um, someone yesterday about this, that uh, what if every farmer and fisherman put a comma ink at the end of their name? Would you then consider them businesses? Because right now they're not. And in fact, farmers, I was talking with our policy person, we have a slate of policy as stimulus bill. And uh, there has been always this friction between the Small Business Association and the farming community. And so, and then on top of that, there is the fact that um, most of the cost of living that farmers have, much like you were talking about, Jamila, that the restaurant owners have rents to pay. They, farmers do too. And the difference here is the farm is also their homes, but they yeah. cannot add to their cost of production, to their cost of living. The kids' clothes can't be added to their cost of living. Their health insurance isn't. The definition of cost of business that the, that the USDA has developed for farmers is so narrow that most of their costs cannot be calculated even if they qualify as businesses to apply for these, um, for these forgivable to nonprofits potentially, but loans uh, period. Yeah, and, and Jamila, you mentioned this, like the, the sort of challenges of these policies, these margins, right? Like everybody thinks that the farmers are just, I think everybody thinks those farmers and fishermen are like living on those boats or living on those fancy farms. I mean, Hugh Atchison is a chef out of Georgia and he wrote a piece and he admitted to having had $26 in the bank the day he closed his restaurants, right? Like that's what he had. And that's not, and that's not uncommon. And I mean, because people don't understand where their food comes from and we're starting to see in Philadelphia what's some potential hiccups in the seafood um, a supply chain because the fisher the fishermen aren't work are aren't working the the bot the the boats are are on the docks 
Um, one of the largest, Samuels and Son, one of the largest distributors in the country is not delivering to New York and they supply your grocery stores in, in New York. Yeah. Um, so there's going to be this hiccup in the supply chain. Um, prices are going to go up and still, and, 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 and so the, and so the markets are going to, those markets are going to go up and then people are going to be wondering, well, why can't they pay? Aren't they super duper rich? No, they really aren't because the restaurants are open and that collapsing of the restaurant industry has this ripple effect that is all the way to your table. And yeah. I think those are the kinds of things that people really don't understand. And we're, um, you know, through some of our stories, what we're trying to show is this is where, this is not only where your food comes from, this is how much it costs. And in some cases, in some neighborhoods, and we will see this in Detroit, um, in LA, in Miami, some neighborhoods that are that have become gentrified or very popular neighborhoods because of the restaurant scene. Well, you're going to start to see if those restaurants don't reopen, then now you're talking about a real estate market collapse as well. And so all of these things are are interconnected from your plate to where you're to where you yeah. live. Um, these things are all they all intersect. And I think as um, as journalists, we have to uh, and of course, the New York Times is is, is doing this. The L.A. Times is, is doing this. Even um, Eater is um, is doing some great work looking at the supply chain. And we are trying to be three steps ahead to keep uh, communities informed about where these hiccups are, are going to be. Are you going to be able to get, um, people are uh, lamenting not being able to go and sit in Starbucks, but you have to start thinking about, well, where is the supply chain? Um, you know, uh, where is that hiccup gonna happen? And Davida, are you seeing that in Detroit with the restaurants there? Are they, are, you know, are the food producers there? Are you already feeling the pinch of the supply chain too? Yeah, so um, um, in Detroit, we have a very um, robust, um, not only um, urban farming community. And so in Detroit, we have um, over 1,600 um, farms and gardens in the city of Detroit. Where so you can the, feed yourselves. Oh, well, I mean, yes. Um, we have the infrastructure um, put in place. And the reason why we have the infrastructure put in place is because Detroit knows what it's like um, when every major regional and national grocery store abandoned us um, mm -hmm. when A&P closed um, in the city of Detroit in 2007. So we are a city of over 700,000 people or just around 700,000 people who clearly understand the importance of what we call food sovereignty. So as a result of that- I was just um, gonna ask you about that. Yeah, so as a result of that, it, I, I have to give credit where credit is due. Our elder communities, um, those individuals who came from the South, whether that South was Mexico or whether that South was Alabama, Mississippi, and Tennessee, who migrated up through the Great Migrations, had to remind us young people, we know how to grow food. Black and brown people know how to grow food. <laughs> so let the grocery stores leave. We'll take this land. We'll take this and we'll convert it to community farms and gardens. So, you know, last year Detroit grew over 600,000 tons of fruits and vegetables. Um, you know, so we were already on a trajectory of food sovereignty. The thing yeah. is, is that many of our market gardens um, really relied upon um, the restaurant community. And so because they are not sure, the restaurants, the chefs are not sure, um, our governor just expanded our quarantine and stay at home place till April 30th. I gotta tell you ladies, I'm very, very, very skeptical um, about us reopening anytime soon. I think there's gonna be another extension if you ask me. So restaurant tours don't even know how to plan, right? Yeah. And so as a result of that, farmers don't know how to plan those who service the restaurant industry. And I'll just say this one thing when it comes to planning. This is why it's so important. And this is why I love the work of the James Beer Foundation. If I can just plug in the boot camp for a second yeah. in terms of the work that you all have been doing in terms of bringing chefs together to make them aware, provide them with resources and empower them to become activists and advocates. Because it is apparent that when the CARES Act was passed and particularly the PPP was, was passed, the language in it did not really support the model for restaurants. And what yeah. I mean by that is that P 
PPP says that yes, this is a payroll protection program that you can apply for, but it turns into a, a loan versus a grant that you have to make sure that the employees that you furloughed or the employees that were on unemployment, that you have your full staff back by June 30th. Yeah. There's so much uncertainty in the marketplace. What chef, what restaurateur knows that they're going to be able by June 30th to hire their entire staff back? No, like it's... it's yeah, the, 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 like the decisions that were made, you know, independent restaurateurs must not have been in the table because this is not something that it conforms to the business model of many restaurants. Yeah, no, it's it's crazy. I mean, there was a whole host of lobbying done on that bill, and the biggest piece of the the two biggest challenges of it are the dates with right. the national extension of unemployment benefits and the $600 sort of plus exactly. up on unemployment benefits that That's goes right. to July 30th and you have to rehire everybody by June 30th. There's no incentive, right? Because are you going to, sure you're going to, if you are a tipped wage worker, are you going to get that? Is the restaurant going to be full? Are you going to get your full hours? Exactly. All of that. So that date is screwed. And then because of the inconsistent guidance on when we may reopen as a country, right? I mean, Virginia is closed until June 15th and you know, every state and municipality is different, but we, we won't be nationally open for business, right? And right. Seattle and San Francisco and other places might come online first, but are you gonna be able, I live in New York and Queens, or am I gonna be able to travel freely to Seattle? Exactly. Right. Like in that time, like, so there's so much in, you know, um, uh, it's, it's really watching the federal government in a really interesting way, build policy while the system is collapsing on itself and trying to solve for the, the last problem in, as opposed to trying to solve for the bigger systematic challenges. I mean, you know, Niaz, that's, I mean, I think that's constantly your call, right. Which is that we have to like kind of blow this up a little, right. And uh, fix it. And now we have this opportunity. We have this pause um, you know, to do this and will we remember those lessons, right? Will we remember that if communities who can feed themselves will come out of this better, <laughs> right? They will have access. I mean, we had a, we had just a couple of question comment and just, I want to posit them and then you guys can, can weigh in on what Davida just said too. But one of them is around what is the best way a consumer who lives in an urban environment and may not have access to those local producers, can, how they get access to them, how can they make different food and shopping choices during this crisis, right? And I think it's a really interesting one because the only food, the only grocery store in Queens and by my house is the local food seller, mm -hmm. right? Where, and there's, uh, there's no, the farmer's market on que in Queens is not open. The Union Square market on Manhattan is open um, yeah. with those smaller farmers. but. Uh, you know, Niaz, I just want to let you back in here on what we were just talking about before we go to these couple of questions. Um, well, they're, they're related in my mind anyway. Yeah. Uh, what I wanted to say, and this, I guess, goes to Jamila's, prof prof Jamila's profession, um, but all of us, in a sense, are becoming citizen journalists in some ways and writing these stories down because what's going to keep us moving forward is by repeating these stories we're experiencing right now. Yeah. We can't let the narrative that we're living end when the country is opened up. We need to keep telling it. We need to keep repeating that we can. Food sovereignty is achievable within communities, within states, within regions. Here in New England, we're working on a regional approach, Food Solutions New England, even before all of this hit, to see whether or not New England can feed itself. At least 50% of the food that we eat is caught, raised, and grown here by the year 60. We're now beginning to experience that date. We're beginning to see people having to feed themselves. And so <clears throat> telling these stories and not forgetting them, not allowing the, uh, the, the book to be shut once the country is open, is really gonna be an important piece of how to move forward. Uh, and related to that is writing the stories about where people are getting food. Uh, the, on the NAMA side, our network, the local catch.org network, you can go to that website and you can find seafood uh, fishermen and seafood businesses that are willing to ship to you regardless of where you live. You know, one of our board members is with the Sitka Salmon Shares, for instance, and they're sending, uh, shipping seafood everywhere. There are these community supported trees that are, that you can pick up from in Philadelphia. And Philadelphia is one of those community supported fisheries, for example, and some of them are shipping. 
I mentioned Patchwork Family Farm. You know, there, there are farms for shipping. Patchwork Family Farm will send you pig parts if you, if you want an Easter ham and you got it in time. You know, you could do that. So those exist. What I don't want to suggest is that the people who are doing that work, the drivers and the deliverers, somehow their lives mean less than the rest of us. So I recognize that that means they have to work and they have to put their lives in danger. But sources do exist. And I hope that by the rest of us practicing what we're told to physically stay home, we allow those workers that are, that are continuing to deliver us food and grow our food and catch our food to at least have a higher confidence that they can be healthy in this process but sources are there that can supply you with just about everything i think the thing that i'm learning i was talking with a neighbor she said yeah i went to the store i couldn't get everything though and i said what is everything i think that's another one of those lessons that we're learning right now that we need to start writing is the difference between need and want yes. and what keeps what sustains us versus what fills the fridge are two different things and those are symbolic of the food system that that we have had and the this food system that we can envision moving forward is really thinking about need versus I guess what Gandhi called need versus greed. And I'm not suggesting people are being greedy because their fridges are full, but I think there is a way to discern between what's really needed and what we're accustomed to. Yeah, and it goes, it goes into another one of the questions and I'd love for any of you to answer it or comment, which is um, this idea of uh, ag producers, farmers, fishermen, everybody being forced to dump their products. Um, because of waste or not picking them up, right? So dumping milk or rotting crops or that kind of thing. So even at these times when we, our system is so broken that we can't get the stuff where it needs to go to the people who need it. And instead, I don't know, Jamila, you wanna, yeah. you're kind of leaning into this one. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'm, um, I'm gonna answer both questions um, because we are seeing in Philadelphia um, a lot of concern about, about food waste. And so a lot of those resources are going to organizations like Phil Abundance to be sure that they can feed people who are hungry um, and also to feed school systems because um, the one piece we haven't talked about is um, uh, a lot of children who, you know, what they get from at school is the only meal that they get um, for the day, um, so school systems are um, are taking a lot of the a lot of that food um, and making sure that um, that children especially um, have access to that. Just to go back to the previous question about where you can find resources, especially in urban environments, a lot we've seen in Philadelphia and in New York, um, a lot of restaurants have turned into kind of pop-up grocery stores. Um, and so they might have, they may not, just to Niaz's point, they may not have everything, but they may have some key ingredients, um, especially canned goods. They'll have um, toilet paper. They might have seafood because they will have access to these distributors. So perhaps the, the delivery is only going to that, that restaurant and they are putting together boxes. They are becoming kind of, they're becoming their own little um, CSAs. So I would just suggest to um, um, the person who asked just to look around your neighborhood, especially at those restaurants um, and, and asking at the grocery store for things like, you know, the sourdough starter, um, if you're going to be making bread, you know, make friends, you have a relationship with those people, you know, keep your distance, but have a relationship with them so that they understand what you're, what you might be looking for. Um, but just being sure that, um, that there there are probably resources um it markets not only markets but restaurants and other organizations within your neighborhood yeah and because i know the questioner um will i also have a list of local um oyster producers who will ship and or you can pick up from um just just because i happen to know that the, the I, I was like oh i know that person who asked that question yeah um, there's so many there are so many places that you know the question i had was whether or not um, all of, you know, we know that a lot of communities have been redlined out of, especially in Detroit, redlined out of supermarkets, redlined out a lot of these things. So this is an opportunity for a lot of food systems to become more equitable and be sure that they are delivering to every neighborhood and for, and for those neighborhoods to demand um, that, um, that the bakeries and 
the fisheries aren't just delivering to higher income neighborhoods. Um, it's, uh, it's remarkable how many um, delivery services don't come to Queens. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like, hey, it, Kath, yes, ma'am. No, oh, I, I just wanted to, um, uh, I looked at the Q&A too, and I would be yep. remiss. Um, there was one comment in our Q&A, um, and that comment was simply, and yellow people too, with an explanation point. And I guess I would be remiss if I did not mention the pain and suffering that our Asian American friends um, has been experiencing all over the country, from Chinatowns in New York to San Francisco. So before, you know, um, when this, when the coronavirus was, was kind of introduced, we were so ignorant um, to the virus. And I just mean that we just didn't have any information. People assumed that this was a bright, the virus that was brought to us, you know, from, from China. Um, and um, many people were afraid to go into the Chinatowns um, all over the country. And so, yeah, I do want to acknowledge the fact they have been suffering since the beginning of the year, yeah. since yeah. January. But this is where, um, and Jamila hit this point earlier, this is where kind of local journalism, this is where community storytelling plays a role. I was just reading in um, Grub Street that um, a, a, a team, a task force has been put together of what they call professional kind of like activists who has wrapped their arms around Chinatown in New York. And now these professionals, they've created websites for these, uh, for these businesses. They're storytelling. There's a beautiful YouTube storyteller story that is now called the Coronavirus Chronicles in Chinatown. And they are telling the story of these restaurants. They're telling the story of the owners. They're telling the story about the cuisine and the workers. And they are getting the message out out that 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 we aren't the problem it wasn't us like it wasn't it's just, us. this 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 ignorance um, that. that so many people have and so the importance of storytelling and and i just want to say that you know in the in, in detroit in the african-american community we stand in solidarity um with with the asian american community who has been experiencing um a decline in their restaurants since the beginning of the year so we have not forgotten about um you as well and we stand in solidarity um with those businesses as well no, thank you. So I want to be super conscious of, I've, we've gone a little over time and our closed captioner has to leave us in about 10 minutes. Um, so, um, and I want to be really respectful of that and, um, and everybody. I, just one last question. I, I always do something at the end of panels that I'm on. I, I want to know one thing that you have seen that brings you hope. And then I want you to, I'm going to come back around and I want you to tell this audience one thing that they can do right, um, to close out the session. So one thing, Jamila, what's a th something that you've seen that's brought you hope during this last four weeks? Um, that there are so many people reaching out that want to tell their own stories. They want to, they want the stories of their communities told, they want to have the impact. Um, and I'm so excited about that because it's something that I've wanted to do. It's why I wanted to work um, with the Philadelphia Inquirer to be sure that the, um, that the food systems are more equitable, that our storytelling is more community driven, that is just not voice on high telling you the best restaurants to go to, but it is something that comes up from the community and they tell their own stories. Um, the thing that you can do, it, 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 is it now? Don't go there yet. Let's go hope first and then we'll come back we'll around and do first. Storytelling, yeah. the opportunities for storytelling, I'm so excited about. Yeah. Niaz, what's bringing you hope? Uh, what brings me hope is uh, those who are seeing beyond the crisis, who, who are looking forward, and I don't mean that in a, um, I'm looking forward to this, but they're looking forward and they're not allowing the crisis to define them. They're allowing a different vision to define the moment. And, um, and that I think is what I wanna build on. That's the foundation that I'm talking about. It's, it's giving those folks the tools to, to move beyond this point in time and in a more permanent way towards something that they're envisioning. And they suddenly felt that moment allowed that vision to have legs. And that gives me hope. I want to see how we can make those legs move. Yeah, because this is a moment in time, right? Like, we just have to keep moving. And Davida, what gives you hope? 
Yeah, I think what, what gives me hope is, is it, it was birthed out of anger um, and frustration, but um, it gives me so much hope. And that is, is that the American people understand that the social contract between the government and its people who they are supposed to serve has been broken. And what gives me hope is that even though I was so angry and I was in tears when I watched it on Tuesday, is that when I saw our fellow citizens in Wisconsin standing in line to cast their vote, to vote, they were in masks. Our elderly people were, had their gloves on. They had their mask on their faces. Many of them were sitting in wheelchairs. They were bound and determined that even through this crisis, I'm going to put my body on the line, even if it means death, but I'm going to cast my vote. You know that reminds me of the Civil Rights Movement, where my ancestors died huh? for the right and the opportunity to vote. And my God, we saw citizens in Wisconsin all over that state risk their lives to cast the vote. America is going to be turned out on, in November. And that gives <laughs> me hope that we are about to have an election in November like we've never seen before. And I am hopeful that we now demand of government to do what it's supposed to be. And that is be responsive to the needs of the people. And, that's, and that brings me hope. So what's your one thing that you want everybody to do, Davida? I think what, if I'm honest, Catherine, like one of the things that I want um, folks to do and piggybacking on that is to go and if you go to your um, county clerk's office right now is to get your absentee ballot. Well, I am not going to listen. I'm a, rep I'm a Democrat born and raised. Everybody in my family is. And so if there's going to be any kind of shenanigans going on in this election, I want us to have our absentee ballot already in application, get our absentee ballot now and be prepared if need be to vote by mail. So that's what I need for you to do. If you are of legal age in voting, make sure that you have the ability to vote, for, vote by mail. I love that so much. Jamila, what's your one thing you want everybody to do? Uh, subscribe to your local news oh. organization. Um, it is vital. Um, news coverage is not free. It costs a lot of money and people are putting, they're putting their lives at risk to keep this story told. Um, most news organizations have taken down their pay, their paywall for all coronavirus coverage, um, but we still have other stories to tell. We have investigations. In order to get policy, we have to have journalism. Um, these things are in, it, it is an intersection, um, but it's not, it's not free. Um, and, and local journalism, your local, that local newspaper, your local civic news organization, whether that is your NPR station, it is vital. So become a subscriber, become a member. Um, it is, uh, a, even if it's just a digital subscription or some kind of um, relationship that you cultivate so that you have news coverage, what you get um, from the national um, coverage is going to be a bigger landscape, but those local news organizations are going to be the people who are going to tell you about those elections, the ones that really matter in people's lives. Uh, we see that with state government and state legislature, um, school boards, county officers, sergeants, those kinds of things. That's what your local news organizations can do. Your local news organizations are going to be the ones that tell you whether or not your grocery store supply chain is in peril. Um, so it's going to be vitally important for you to support your local news organizations. Wow. Niaz? Um, God, it's hard to narrow it down to one thing. My, <laughs> my, on some level, I want to be philosophical. <laughs> you know, I want to talk about you know, the reality is even though they impact this disproportionate on different communities, we know that. Um, there, there has been, this virus has been almost the great equalizer in, in some ways. And, um, and so can we use this as an opportunity to uh, tune our ability to be more, to have more empathy as a society, to, to have, um, now I don't use the word very often, but to have more love for, for those in our concentric circles that that go as far as the entire globe itself 
So I think that's the philosophical part of me that because I feel like we as a society we're told to suppress those things and uh, in this moment we're feeling it and it's okay to feel it and it's okay to express it even if you can't go and hug somebody. I was um, that one of the UPS delivery came and my dog loves people and he runs up to the UPS and says, no, Brewski, don't jump. And the UPS man says, no, I don't mind the jump. I could use a hug. Oh. And so there is this moment that everybody is feeling or lacking that sense. So if we can just uh, just the vibe that we can put out there um, uh, is important. On a more tactile level, I think because we're talking about food, I want to encourage people to really examine their fridges and their pantries and really think about um, what feeds you versus um, what you don't really need and think about uh, what feeds you, um, how much of it, where is it coming? Really give that some thought and really see whether or not there can be a spring cleaning of how you eat and uh, in this moment of opportunity. Oh my God, I love that so much. Um, yeah, I mean, you guys hit all the notes unscripted of what I would have wanted you to hit, you know, the sort of consumer behavior of, I love that, the spring cleaning of what we what we want to eat and should eat and how we eat is amazing. And, you know, the idea that we need to support all the activism and journalism that's going on in our communities and find ways to do that. And, you know, the, the plea to subscribe to that. And then, you know, Every seminar and everything we do at Beard always ends like the most important thing you could do this November is vote. And so, yes, I feel like, yes, you should go get register for your absentee ballot now because we don't know what the world sort of holds. And um, it is probably we're not going to get the food system that we want and the change that we want unless we literally change our government. So um, at the state and local level. So. Um, and federal levels. So I just want to say thank you to all three of you for joining us tonight. Thank you for sticking with us a little late. Um, thanks to all the people that joined us. When these Zoom things yes, end, you. they end very abruptly. So we will literally disappear. So I just, you are three women who I admire and respect and consider just mentors and also just lovely humans. And I second the, the deal that we try to find some empathy in this situation. And and try and use this as an opportunity to build the food system that we want to build. And so I just really, really thank you for joining us tonight. And uh, thank you, Catherine. Thank you, thank Catherine. You, absolutely. Thank you for all the work that you are doing. Thank you, Sign Institute, for um, for putting this together yes. and yeah. all the panelists. I'm so, it's such a treasure to be able to see all of your faces. It really is. I look forward to a time when we can all share a meal together in a restaurant. Um, but thank you to the Sign Institute tonight. Thank you. Um, to all the folks who joined us this evening. And with that, they will turn us off. So good night. Right. Good night, <laughs> good night. Be safe and healthy, everyone. Good Me night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.